Uh, lesson four, we're going to talk a little bit more about prophetic ministry, the gift of prophecy, its role in the New Testament, how we should relate to it. And man, this is something, especially in some circles, is really big. Uh, people are building their lives around it today, sadly, sadly enough so. I want to give an Old Testament story. And you can read the entire story in 1 Kings chapter 13. It's one of the most interesting, intriguing, and even puzzling stories in the entire Bible. And, and for the puzzling part, just remember it, it's Old Testament. But here's what happened. There's an individual, he's described as a man of God, but he would probably also could, would, would uh, carry the name of a prophet. But God spoke to him and told him to go to Bethel where Jeroboam, uh, the king of Israel, had set up idols there and, and, and were having the people to worship idols and said, these are the gods that brought you out of Israel. What a terrible thing. And he had built an altar there for this idolatrous worship. And God spoke to this. He's called in the passage, 1 Kings 13, a man of God, to go there and prophesy against the altar at Bethel. And he gave him certain commands. He told him he was not to stop to eat and drink. In other words, he was not to stop to fellowship, to chit chat along the way. He was to go there, carry out his mission, speak the word of the Lord, and then he was to return home by a different route than he came. So he had his marching orders. So he goes there, he travels uh, to Bethel, and he speaks the word of the Lord, and God confirms his word, and, uh, and, and the altar breaks in half, and the ashes are poured out, and King Jeroboam, God touches his life, at least temporarily, and he invites this man of God to go home with him. He wants to bless him, and he wants to, you know, give him some refreshments and food. But he says to him, based on what God told him, if you gave me half of your house, in other words, if you gave me half of your, the, the king, if you gave me half of your possessions, I could not go home with you because God instructed me that I was not to stop to eat or drink. I was to come here, speak his word, and return home by another path. And so he heads home. Well, there were a couple of young men there. They went home and they told their father what had happened. And their father is what the, the passage calls an old prophet. So he says to his sons, which way did he go? And, and they tell him, he said, well, saddle up my donkey. So they saddle his donkey and the old prophet heads out and he catches up with the man of God and says, uh, come home to my house and I will lodge you for the night and feed you and feed your donkey and, and so on. And the man of God says, I can't do it. When God sent me on this mission, he told me I was to not stop to eat or drink but I was to carry out my mission and return home another way. Now here's where this story gets very interested and relative. The old prophet said, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel of the Lord spoke to me and said that I was to bring you to my home and lodge you and host you and feed you. And so based on what the old prophet said, who actually the scripture says, but he was lying. Why in the world would somebody tell a lie? Somebody who is called an old prophet. Why would he do that? One of those puzzling things. We, we could uh, speculate about it, but we won't go there. But we will, we will share some things that will come out of this. So he goes home with him. And as they're sitting and eating, the Spirit of God comes upon the old prophet, the one who lied to him to get him to come there. And he prophesies to the man of God and tells him because he has disobeyed the word and the command of the Lord that you will not be buried in the place of your fathers. In other words, you're going to die. But you're going to die before you get back home. You will not get to be buried in the family cemetery, in the family burial place. And so the old man, after, after it's all over, 
And they finished the refreshments. The man of God, as he's called, he saddles his donkey. He heads on his way back to his home. And on his way home, a lion meets him and attacks him and kills him and leaves his body. Doesn't eat him, but leaves his body lying by the roadside and his donkey standing there by him. And people pass by and see it, but they just keep going. But then finally the word gets back to the old prophet, as he is called. And so he comes and he takes the body of the man of God that he lied to. Lied to and influenced him to disobey the command God had given him. My friends, if, you, if God has spoken to you, do not be distracted in any way from doing what he's told you to do, regardless of what somebody else says. Even if, like the old prophet, they say, Thus saith the Lord, do not be distracted from what God has told you to do until you know in your own heart that that's what you are to do. Well, so the old prophet... Pardon? Sue, Sue is trying to say said, something. Turn your phone your, on, Sue. Turn your mic on. Never take your cues from people or situations or circumstances. Those things can confirm and affirm, but we must know from the inside out Absolutely. what God wants us to do. Many years ago in the 1970s when I was a student in Bible school, I attended a church in uh, Dallas, Texas. This is back in the 70s that was founded and pastored by one of the leaders of the healing revivals of the 50s and 60s. And, uh, uh, and, and so th there, there was an emphasis on healings and, and miracles and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I will never forget W.B. Grant Sr. saying <laughs> one time, uh, and he was expressing frustration because he couldn't keep a good assistant. And he made this statement. And I'm sure this was visiting preachers that came through that, that were doing this. I think maybe other people do. But anyway, he said, every time I get a good assistant here, somebody comes along and prophesies to them that God has a ministry for them greater than Elijah, and the next thing I know, they're gone. Well, see, we can't, we can't base our lives and our future on what other people say. We have to know, like this story in 1 Kings 13. So the old prophet, the lying prophet, he took the body of the man of God and took him back and gave him a burial in his own family burial place and then instructed his sons that when he died, he wanted to be his bones to be laid next to the man of God that he had lied to and resulted in him losing his life because he disobeyed God, because he listened to this old prophet rather than continuing to heed and obey what God had told him to do. Now there's a, uh, an interesting story from history. George Whitfield, the most famous preacher of the Great Awakening, uh, the, uh, his name slips me at the moment, but the professor of church history at Baylor University calls George Whitfield America's spiritual founding father. He had that kind of influence on the founding of America. George Whitfield was the most recognizable figure in colonial America. He preached up and down the eastern seaboard when the population was maybe three million, two and a half, three million. He preached outdoors commonly to crowds of five, ten, fifteen thousand, and to an estimated crowd of twenty-five thousand on the Boston Common when the population of Boston was only seventeen thousand. And so George Whitfield was a giant in the founding of America, his influence. As a young man about to take his first trip across the Atlantic to America, 17, I believe, 1739, he was sitting on a boat waiting to sail away to America because he felt a call from God to come to America to preach the gospel. In the meantime, John Wesley, 
who had been his teacher and his mentor, who was, I believe, about 10 years his senior, and whom he had great respect for. Uh, maybe I hit it. In his, uh, John Wesley, who was 10 years his senior, and whom George Whitfield had great respect for, because John and Charles Wesley had nurtured him as a new believer at Oxford University and helped him in his Christian walk. And John Wesley, sometime before this, had gone off to Georgia to preach, but his trip to America did not work out, and he returned home feeling defeated and disillusioned. And maybe this was, was the reason. But young George is sitting on the boat waiting to sail, and John Wesley, who's just returned from Georgia, sends a letter to him, has it delivered on the ship, and says to him, God has spoken that you are not to go to America. Return immediately to London. <laughs> well, this was, this was, I mean, he had great respect for John Wesley. What is he going to do? And so he tells about how he went to prayer, seeking God about this. And he said as he was praying, the story of this man of God and the old prophet that I just shared with you, he said immediately came to his mind and was impressed upon his heart and his mind. And he knew that even though he had great regard for John Wesley, that he was not to listen to John Wesley, that he was to sail to America. And history bears out that George Whitfield did the right thing. America opened its arms to him, and he made seven visits to America, preaching to thousands up and down the eastern seaboard. Friends, close friends with Benjamin Franklin, impacted to one degree or another all of America's founders and became America's spiritual founding father. I'm so glad that George Whitfield did not listen to John Wesley. Even though John Wesley is one of my heroes in history, I'm so glad George Whitfield did not listen to him. And so we have to know, my friends, as you just said, Sue, we have to know in ourselves what it is God wants us to do. Because if we take our cues from the outside, if we take our cues from circumstances, if we take our cues from what people say, if we take our cues from the thus saith the Lord's that come our way, we will be going in circles all of our lives. We must know in our hearts what it is. And you see, if you are a born again child of God and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. You have a mediator between you and God. God would not have you getting, you know, what you need to know. Yes, we're to learn, we're to listen, we're to learn, but I'm talking about from making decisions, important decisions in life. God wants you to know in your own heart what it is that He would have you to do. And you can have that knowing down on the inside. You can know that you know that you know. And then there can be these, however God chooses to do it, affirmations or confirmations or encouragements along the way that God will send into your life. And He will do it sovereignly of His own will in His way, in His time, and in His place. Now, let's look at Paul. We see this same approach in the life of Paul the Apostle. So if you would turn over to Acts chapter 19, I want to read a verse of scripture there about Paul, and we're going to learn from the life of Paul. Acts chapter 19. And this is while Paul is in Ephesus. He was there about three years. And verse 20 of Acts 19, Luke sums up his ministry in that place and says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Verse 21 says, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit 
when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. I feel like I should stop and just back up for a moment and tell you, just give you an example of how God sovereignly, in His way and in His time, He can bring the affirmation, the confirmation, the encouragement you need. We get in trouble when we start go looking for a word. And there are people out there, man, they're ready to give you a word. And uh, when we go out and we start seeking a word, that's where we're going to get in trouble. But when we seek the Lord for ourselves and we know in our heart what He wants us to do, then we can trust that God has ways. God has a body and He works through His body and He can get the encouragement to us and sometimes He will do it when we're trusting Him in the most unusual circumstances and situations. And, and this one story I'm going to tell you about, it, it, it was something. It stayed with me. It was obvious it was God at a time where I needed some encouragement. I was very uh, sick. I was dealing with uh, loss of energy, sharp pains in my chest, my heart palpitating and sputtering. I could feel it beating in my neck and my arms. Uh, I, I, I could walk just a little ways and start seeing stars. I didn't go to the doctor at that time. This is way back in 1989 because I didn't have any health insurance. And besides that, I was afraid that if I went in, they'd immediately want to cut me open, taking my heart out and do all sorts of things. So, so I didn't go. And so I was reading my Bible every day, going through all of the, he the healing scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and reading all my books on faith and healing all over again. But it was a long battle. And sometimes we do have those long battles. Moses, Israel was in a long battle one time. You know the story how Aaron and Hur got on each side of his arms to hold them up until the victory was won. Sometimes we need somebody to come along, lift our arms, and encourage us. But here's the thing. Let God send them along. If you go out and looking for it, hey, you know, again, that's where you can be led astray so easily. So I did not have what it took to go out and preach and minister. So the only thing I knew to do to have money coming in, Richard Roberts had a daily TV program and they had what they called the Abundant Life Prayer Group back then. And so um, I went over and they paid me some kind of s small salary. But I met some wonderful people there that became longtime friends. And uh, Charles and Elijah will know this. This is where we met Larry and Betty Cobb. But um, uh, I was answering the phone and praying with people. And usually people praying because they see the number on the TV and, you know, they're needing prayer. They're desperate. And uh, I got a call one day. And uh, it, was, uh, it was an African-American woman. And I uh, was talking to her, and she was very down, and she wanted prayer for her family, for her husband. And, uh, and so I prayed with her over the phone. I'm sitting there, and I'm in a state. I'm wondering if they're going to have to carry me out on a stretcher before it's over with. I'm sitting there with my heart palpitating and pains in my chest. And so, but I go ahead and I pray for her. And I want to speak a word of encouragement to her. And here's the thing also, my, fr my folks, that, that we all need to learn. Never allow difficulties to turn you inward. Keep flowing out to other people and encouraging them. Even when you feel you need encouragement, keep flowing out. Uh, Sue, what's the problem? Okay. Okay. Um, Okay. Always keep flowing out. Do not get turned inward. Do not get blocked in. Is it still crackling? Well, let me, uh, I'll try unplugging it and plugging it back in. Uh, earlier people said everything was clear, so maybe you could get some feedback to see. Keep flowing out. Do not get turned inward. Keep flowing out. So even though I was in this kind of state, I didn't know 
when I went there each day, if I would get carried out on a stretcher before it was over, hey, yes, I was believing God. I was trusting God. I was doing all the things that I knew to do. But anyway, so I was talking to this woman and I prayed for her, prayed for her family and, and encouraged her. And, and, and in closing, I said, I believe God is working on your behalf. And when I said that, she broke out speaking in tongues. Now, I had lived long enough walking with the Lord. I think about 99% of the time, I can tell if a tongue is a tongue that requires an interpretation. It's for the people, the congregation, or a person, or if it is a prayer or praise unto God. And when she started speaking in tongues, it was just so clear to me. I knew that was a tongue that had interpretation. I didn't have the interpretation. I didn't know what was going to come of it, but I just thought, well, I'll just wait here and see what happens. So the last thing I'd said to her, this woman who was really down and needing prayer, the last thing I'd said to her, I, prayed, I said, I believe God is working for you. And so, and when I said that, she breaks out in tongues over the phone. And this took, I'm sure, some courage for her because she's called this number on the TV screen to get prayer. And now here she is speaking back. But when she finished, she said, Yes, and I am working for you too, my son. Watch me work. Now, I knew, see, I knew that that tongue was a message. And I sensed it was likely a message for me. I didn't have the interpretation, but it came forth. And that proved to be an incredible word of encouragement to me. It wasn't something I went out looking for. It wasn't something I sought for, but God sent it exactly when I needed it in a way I could never have manufactured and thought up. And folks, that's the kind I like. You know it's God. You know you didn't manufacture it. You know you didn't make it happen. You know that God Almighty in heaven has orchestrated things and He has caused it to come to pass in that way. Oh, that's what we need in the church today. We need a trust in God that looks to Him and opening and, and, and open to God using whoever and however He wants in our lives. Hallelujah. Yeah, I, I, I spoke that. Was, yes, and I am working for you too, my son. Watch me work. Yeah, watch me work. I am working for you, my son. Also, watch me work. And so, I, you know, I just even as I say that, that's faith building. I feel like somebody out there, Sue, could receive that. Because, you know, God's working for you. He's, he has no favorites. He's working for you. He's working for you, my son, my daughter. So you too, watch him work. Put your trust totally in Him and watch Him work on your behalf. And we declare that tonight. God, you are working on behalf of your people. And there is an Old Testament promise that says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking those of a sincere heart that He might show Himself strong on their behalf, that He might work on their behalf. Oh, hallelujah. God, thank you for working on behalf of your people. Thank you for helping your people tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. I feel that, I sense that stirring down in my soul. God wants us to know that He works on behalf of His people. Hallelujah. And so that was a, that was an encouraging prophetic word that came to me. Didn't seek it, didn't look for it. And, and I, I could never have done anything like that. Could never have manufactured that. And again, I love the ones that we know we didn't manufacture, that we didn't make happen. We know it's God and that God has broken through on our behalf. So in Acts chapter 19, now we're going to move on. But man, there's a, there's a sila. There is a sila there. Oh, let God encourage your heart tonight. Let God encourage your heart tonight. Listen to that still small voice whispering to your heart. I'm working on your behalf. God will lift you up. God will raise you up. God will give you the encouragement you need. Either directly, He can also send it, but let Him do it in His way. 
and in his time, and then you will know it was really God. Eddie, there is a, there is a hymn that's come to me the last three weeks, two weeks and this week, and it came to me several times today, so just now I searched for it uh, on the computer, and I'm going to read it. This was a hymn I, I learned as a child in the United Church of Canada. Mm -hmm. God sees the little sparrow fall, it meets his tender view. If God so loved the little birds, I know he loves me too. He loves me too, he loves me too, I know he loves me too. Because he loves the little things, I know he loves me too. Second verse, he paints the lily of the field, perfumes each lily bell. If he so loves the little flowers, I know he loves, he loves me well. Third verse, God made the little birds and flowers and all things large and small. He'll not forget his little ones. I know he loves them all. He loves me too. He loves me too. I know he loves me too. Because he loves the little things, I know he loves me too. You know, I just, I feel like God has been wanting to say that <laughs> to, to, to our friends, to our little group. Yeah. He cares. Yeah. And we can cast our care on him. Somebody needs to cast their care on him tonight. Yes. And that him, if you want to look it up and get the words, look up, God sees the little sparrow fall. Mm. Look it up. Somebody yeah, needs that. And, and let the Holy Spirit minister to you because I know he is doing that. Someone really, 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 really needs to yeah. understand and grasp the reality that God cares for you. Yeah, amen, amen, that's Praise good too. Praise the Lord, praise yeah, the Lord. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a powerful ministry of encouragement right now. God's wanting, God is encouraging people right Watch now. Watch me work He's restoring for you. hope right now. And God is re encouraging and restoring hope right now. And so just receive it. Receive it in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Lord. We just pause right now and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for restoring hope in people's hearts. God, where, where, where hope has been lost, thank you that you're restoring it tonight. Thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you for restoring a confidence that you, Lord, that you really are working on our behalf and you're working on their behalf oh God because they're your children and you have promised in Jesus name amen you gonna play it no it's not it's on through. it's only an instrumental that you have there yeah. okay okay Eddie Acts chapter 19 our theme you know no in yourself what God wants you to do. Yeah. Know in yourself what God wants you to do. Yes, be teachable, but know in yourself what God wants you to do. Acts chapter 19, verse 21, Paul's in Ephesus. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit. In other words, he, he made a decision in the core of his being. There was, there was, there was a depth to it. It wasn't something light and frivolous. He purposed in the Spirit. When he, would, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So there is a deep desire, determination, to go to Jerusalem and then on to Rome. And so he heads out in that direction. But he encounters things along the way where people, even out of their concern and care for him, where they try to deter him and keep him from doing what he has decided and determined to do down in the core of his being. He expresses this again in Acts again, chapter 20. Verse 22, he's meeting with the elders of the church at Ephesus and he reminds them of his ministry there for three years. He's, he's, he's been up into Macedonia, now he's coming back through Ephesus again on his way to Jerusalem. 
And he called for the elders of the church in Jerusalem. I want to read this first part starting at verse 18. It says, And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears. Paul was not a stoic hard-hearted type of person. Paul was a person who wept easily and he reminded them. Uh, uh, tears doesn't mean that you're not strong. Paul was a very strong person, determined person, but he had a heart about him. He wept over his converts. He wept over people. And he reminded them, he says, how I serve the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks. Re what did he testify? What was his message? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this one, verse 22, want to zero on it. And see, now I go bound into in the spirit to Jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there now I just want to read a couple of other translations and I want to ask you if you've had this sense the NIV he says to them and now compelled by the spirit I am going to Jerusalem the New Living Translation has it and now I am going to Jerusalem, drawn there irresistibly by the Holy Spirit. Drawn there irresistibly by the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to the NIV. And now compelled by the Spirit. Paul felt constrained, compelled. He was going to Jerusalem come hell, high water, opposition, Whatever, there was something inside of him, he felt compelled he had to go. Have you ever felt compelled <laughs> like that by the Spirit? Oh, the first time I remember ever sensing that, Sue, was when I went to India in 1983, and I had my ticket, but I had no more money. I had $30, and I had an overnight in London, I had an overnight in Delhi, and I had at least two, maybe three nights in Calcutta. And so I have probably uh, at least five nights that I've got to cover en route in foreign cities, plus food. And the day for my departure comes, I have my ticket and $30. I don't have, I don't have enough for even one night. But you know, I had this, I was compelled. I was determined. I was going. If I had to sleep on the sidewalk in Calcutta and Delhi and London, I was going to India. I felt that strongly about it. Never even considered not going. Even when I woke up the next morning and then I've been looking and I had read stories of you know, people had told about, you know, God came, someone came and knocked on their door and said, God told me to bring you this. <laughs> and so the day I was to leave, we, I waited around for that somebody to come knocking on my door. Nobody came. So, but I was compelled. Didn't matter. I was going. We got in our car on the way to uh, pick up my ticket from the travel agency and into the airport, stopped at the post office. Maybe there's a check in the mail. Went in, nothing in the mailbox. And I still remember, that's been, that was 1983, so I still remember what I said when I got in our vehicle. I got in and I said, well, God has ways to provide besides the post office. And we've said that many times since. <laughs> <laughs> but now I had no idea what it could be. Because as far as I knew, that was God's last opportunity to come through the post office, because now all that was left, my ticket had already been settled and paid for, and now I just had to pick it up and go get on the plane. 
But my friends, let me tell you this. I have learned God has ways to bring about His purposes for your life that you've never thought of. God has ways to provide for you that you have never thought of. What does it say there in that passage? Uh, it says, I has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love Him. And yes, that... that can mean the things He's prepared for us in the future life in heaven, but that can also apply to things right here on the earth. The eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, and it has entered into your heart the way God can work on your behalf if you will trust only in Him and let Him work it out the way He chooses to work it out. Then you know this is God. Wow. So I went to the... Travel agency, walked in to pick up my ticket, go from there to the airport. And the lady there was kind of in a tizzy, and she said, oh, I've been trying to get in touch with you. I tried to call you last night and couldn't get you. I said, well, what's the problem? She said, oh, I, I've had to change your routing. I guess there were some kind of riots or something in the northeast part of India, I think in Delhi. And so she had to do some kind of rescheduling. So I said, what time do I get to Guahoti? That was my ultimate destination. She said, you still get there at the same time, but you just, I just had to reroute you. And she was still typing up my new itinerary. And so as I'm sitting there waiting on her to finish, a thought comes to my mind. And I said, um, what's going to be the difference in price? She said, well, I don't know. Let me see. She does some more typing and looking. And lo and behold... It was $300 less, and I walked out with my ticket and $300. <laughs> Back in those days, that was a lot of money. That was, that was a lot more than it is today. Oh, I knew God had come through in a way I could never have manufactured and thought of and schemed and strategized and plan. Oh, my friends, the eye has not seen nor has the ear heard the things that God will do and how He will work for those who love Him and put their trust in Him. I was compelled to go. And I didn't have to sleep on any sidewalks. Had a wonderful time. God moved powerfully. And it was the beginning of a wonderful, lifelong friendship with Joseph Skinner, who passed away about three years ago, and his brother Kit Bach, who, who could be on with us tonight. Kit Bach, are you out there? Let us hear from you. They're in Northeast India. Wonderful family having a powerful impact in India and all over Asia. Oh, I was compelled to go. Nothing was going to deter me. Uh, thus saith the Lord wouldn't have deterred me because I knew in my heart I was compelled in the Spirit to go. Hallelujah. Have you ever been compelled like that? <laughs> Do you want to hear what some folks are saying about yes. that? Yes, yes. Okay, just a minute. And now compelled by the Spirit, Paul says, Tara I am Chambers going to says, Jerusalem. Yes, 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 compelled to come to Dallas. See you guys soon. That's shouting preaching, y'all. Who is and, this? Uh, Tara Chambers. Okay, Tara, God bless and you. And Laura Uptegrove, yes, I have been compelled, no matter, matter how heavy the hail. And Tara Chambers says, hallelujah. Um, so, so, yeah, people are responding. And, folks, I've asked Rhonda if she would take care of things on, on uh, the live stream chat. So she's interacting with you there, and it's great. What a blessing Rhonda and Pete are. Okay. So Paul is compelled. He's compelled to go to Jerusalem. He says, I don't know what's going to happen there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. You know, God is a loving Heavenly Father, but He is not an overprotective parent that has us tied to His apron strings. And I, and I hope you can get this. Yes, God loves us. He cares for us. 
He will protect us. But also when, when he knows that we are mature enough, when he knows we're strong enough and he can trust us, he will send us to places. He sent Paul right into the mouth of the lion. He sent Paul to Jerusalem where, where he was mobbed, where he was turned over to the Romans. Because you see, we, feel in a, we live in a fallen, sinful world. And Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And so he sends us sometimes forth in the midst of wolves. Why? Because he knows he can trust us and he needs us to share his word with this world in which we live. And so Paul, but, but God lets him know there's going to be some trouble, Paul, in this mission. Paul, I'm so glad that I can count on you, Paul. I'm so glad, Paul, that you're not a, a wimp, that you're not a snowflake, that I can send you, Paul, into the most excruciating situations, and I can count on you, Paul, to be faithful and speak my word. Oh, folks, are there some Pauls, male or female? Could be either one but I'm talking about the character. Are there some Pauls out there that God can say, hey, I'm so thankful that you're my child, so thankful that you've grown up, you're not a snowflake, you're not a wimp, and I can trust you, I can send you anywhere in this world to be my voice, and I can count on you. Oh, may we be those kinds of people today. Those kind of people will change America and the world. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Joyce Lynn says, I always try to speak hope to hurting people. And uh, Steve Keebler says, oh, you are so right tonight, Eddie. So, so Paul is responding. on this journey. I'm so happy that we can uh, have this interaction because I've yeah. said to folks, we don't want it to be us talking at people so that's why we really want to capture these things that folks are saying and and Ken, Ken and Karen God bless you Ken and Karen yes Ken says he's going to learn that song that I just read great Ken yes wonderful uh, you you learn it record it and we will play it yes so Paul heads out from Ephesus he, he where he talks to the elders that he's compelled to go to Jerusalem and he's on his way and on down in, in uh, chapter 21, uh, they stop in a place uh, at T Tyre, T-Y-R-E, which is north of, of Israel, north of Jerusalem. And uh, he said, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. Say so they, they were on a cargo ship, had to be unloaded. So they found some disciples. Verse 4, in finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. And during their time there, Luke says they told Paul, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. In other words, they had a thus saith the Lord for Paul. Paul, do not go to Jerusalem. So what do you do when you are compelled by the Spirit? When you know you're compelled by the Spirit, you're not, uh, th th there, there's no storm, no wind, no rain, no hail, no high water, no thus saith the Lord. No old prophet who might be speaking off the top of his head or outright lying is going to deter you from doing what you know to do in your heart. Now, how do we explain this, that they spoke to Paul through the Spirit? It is very possible. One of the ways we miss God is not only not hearing Him or thinking, just thinking we're hearing Him, but when we hear Him, putting our own spin and misinterpreting what he's saying. So these, it's possible, and I, I'm, I'm offering you a, a theory here, and I think it's the most likely one. It is likely that these disciples who were filled with the Holy Spirit, that they sensed that there's something ominous that was awaiting for Paul in Jerusalem. And they interpreted that that he was not to go to Jerusalem. I believe that when we are going to face challenges, that God will prepare us for it. He will mentally prepare us and warn us 
to, so that we are mentally, and if we have to be prepared, otherwise prepared for any types of challenges and difficulties that we're going to face. And it's very possible that the Spirit, by the Spirit that they sense something ominous about Paul's visit to Jerusalem. But instead of just saying that, they put their own spin on it and told him he wasn't to go. And so this is why. This happens all the time, folks, by the way. <laughs> this happens, I'm afraid, much too often in the prophetic ministry today. Even when we hear the Lord putting our own thoughts and our own spin and our own in misinterpretation on it. So, what, how did Paul respond to this? Apparently, from what we can see, Paul ignored it. He didn't, he didn't rebuke them. He didn't criticize them. He just ignored it. Keep reading. Verse 5. When we had come to the end of those days, we parted and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And so these people, these same people, they, th there was a bond of love there, no question. They all accompanied Paul and Luke and the others to the shore of the ship, and they all knelt down and prayed. And then Paul and the others boarded the ship. Where? On their way to Jerusalem. <laughs> because Paul knew he was compelled in his heart. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem. And then you know the story. We go on further. Verse 8, on the next day, verse 8 of 21, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now this man, Philip, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So they, they, gave, they, they moved in the spirit. They prophesied. And it doesn't say that here, but I suspect that they prophesied to Paul. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus. So this was a person who prophesied on a regular basis, apparently. We talked in the past, go back and look at last week, there is, there is no offices in the New Testament. Leadership is functional. These words that we think of as titles, they are designations expressing people's responsibility and what they do. This is borne out by the fact that they are never put in front of people's names as titles. Never. You never find anybody with a title in front of their name because these words are designations of their responsibility or what, what they do. And so, on the next day, verse 10, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now listen to how, what Luke says. Now when we, who's we? That's Luke, Agabus, Philip, his four daughters, all of the people who were there. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered. You, you, now here you see Paul. You see his tender heart, but also his determination. Someone said many years ago, we heard it was actually Pastor Bob Nichols in Fort Worth said, we never forgot this, that in the ministry, if you're going to follow the Lord, especially if you're going to be in leadership, you've got to have a tough hide and a tender heart. <laughs> and you can see Paul, he's got a tender heart, but he is not going to be moved by all of their crying and pleading. And he says, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? Paul says, hey, you're breaking my heart with your pleading and your weeping. He says, for I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem. You know, my friends, when you reach that place in life where you're not afraid of death, the ultimate fear of humanity is death. And when you overcome, when a person overcomes the fear of death, 
they're not afraid of anything. And Paul had overcome the fear of death. So he couldn't be made afraid, you know, of lions, of imprisonments. If he knew in his heart God was calling him, nothing was going to deter him at this point. What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, how we need that kind of commitment in the church of Jesus Christ today. Got too many snowflake Christians in America. Hallelujah. And I'm sure in many other parts of the world. You know, snowflakes, they melt in the heat. Can't stand the heat. My friends, Paul was no snowflake. And God needs some Christians today that they're not afraid of anything. They're not afraid of death. Their heart's desire, as Paul said, is to bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ and to spread His message into all the world. Verse 14, so Luke says, So when he would not be persuaded, Oh, Paul says, you're breaking my heart, but you're not going to change my mind. <laughs> you're breaking my heart, but you're not going to change my mind. I am compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going. Verse 14, so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased. In other words, we stopped. We stopped pleading. We stopped. And we just said, the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Well, now I want to, 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 I want to read something to you. There were things that happened. I'd like to point out that Agapus' prof, uh, prophecy, even though I believe he was speaking by the Spirit, but it wasn't. Maybe there was a little bit of Agabus in there because it wasn't exactly accurate. He said, With this belt, so will the Jews in Jerusalem bind this man and deliver him to the Gentiles. It didn't exactly happen that way. He was mobbed in Jerusalem by a, the Jews, mobbed him, and were going to kill him. But then the Romans, the Gentiles, came actually and rescued him from the, Gent from the Jews. And then imprisoned him, he was a Roman citizen, and imprisoned him and made him a Roman prisoner. But what I wanted to read to you was, so he gets, he gets mobbed at the temple area in Jerusalem, and then the Romans come down and take him, and they're going to flog him, but then they find out he's a Roman citizen, so they incarcerate him. But do you remember, I'm going to read something, then I'll go back and read. Later on, the Romans allow Paul to appear before the, the Sanhedrin uh, to be tried before them. But then as a Roman citizen, Paul has the choice if he wants to be tried as a Jew in Jerusalem or as a Roman citizen in Rome. And at that time, not because he was not ultimately committed to his Jewish heritage and to Jesus Christ, but because he felt he would get a more fair hearing before a Roman uh, court of law, he opted to be tried in Rome. And so he was being held. So he, he has been mobbed. He's been rejected by his own people. And now he's going to be sent to Rome as a prisoner. And I want to tell you, show you what the Lord said. This was, boy, this was an encouraging word. But this is based on, this is tied to what Paul said initially when he left sometime before this, when he left Ephesus. 1921, we'll close with this. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit. When he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, that would be Greece, to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So there were two places he felt compelled he had to go, Jerusalem and Rome. And in the midst of all of this stuff happening that actually he had been spiritually, mentally prepared for, all of this opposition, the mobbing, the imprisonment, 
God speaks to him one night. Luke tells about it in Acts 23, 11. But the following night, and by the way, a little thus saith the Lord would not have worked in a time like this. A little thus saith the Lord, I say unto thee, my child, I love thee. That would not have worked for Paul. My friends, there are times in life a little prophecy. You're going to need more than that to get you through. Chapter 23, verse 11. But the following night, the Lord <laughs> stood by him. Oh, when you got your trust in Jesus, and when you need something more, the Lord himself will stand by you and give you the word that you need. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness where at Rome. Wow! Months and months before this, maybe years, I would have to check it out. When Paul was compelled, leaving Ephesus, he said, I'm going to go through Macedonia and Greece, and then I must go to Jerusalem, and then I must go on to Rome. Wow! That was birthed in him by the Spirit of God. And now here in the midst of turmoil, opposition, mobbings, imprisonments, the Lord himself stands by Paul and gives him the encouraging word that he needs. I want you to know that if your trust is in Jesus, he will give you not only the encouragement you need, but on the level that you need. And nothing but a personal word from God. Not mediate, mediate, is that the word mediated through somebody else, but Jesus himself, that was what Paul needed. And I'm going to read it again. But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. And God would say that to you tonight. Maybe you feel like you've been mobbed, imprisoned, bound, all kinds of things happening Jesus would say to you, be of good cheer. <laughs> be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem. You see, don't ever lose your testimony for Jesus. This is what it's all about. Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria unto the othermost parts of the earth. And now here Jesus commends him. Paul never lost his testimony in the face of stonings, shipwreck, mobbings, imprisonment. He never lost his purpose, his testimony. Never lose your purpose. Never give up on your testimony. And you will hear the Lord commend you in this life and in the next, I believe. And here in this life, Paul heard, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness of me in Rome. God has called us, and I'm talking all of you, some of you, you know God, and many of you, thank you so much for your love, your prayers, and your support. God has called us, whatever we're doing in the Hall of Fame or whatever, ultimately the purpose, the ultimate goal is to testify of Him in Grapevine, in Texas, in America, in Canada, in Mexico, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And may we all be found faithful in our testimony of Jesus and fulfilling the purpose that He has put in our heart and in yours. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight.